In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. On the second day of youth ministry school, students are given the code. And they are told, learn this code well. Memorize it, use it, get all your youth to understand what it means. This code is going to save you from a world of grief and a whole lot of trouble. Learn this code. And the code is, what comes next? What comes next? And here's what the code means. It is the normal, natural reaction of teenagers to think they're invisible. Invincible, not invisible, invincible. <laughs> they may think they're invisible too, but invincible. It is the natural and normal way of teenagers to live in the present. What comes next? helps them to see the consequences that follow what they're doing at the moment. For example, it's the back to school year kickoff and the youth are all gathered together and they're having a pool party and the guys have girls on their shoulders and Maggie's about to push Kate over and the youth minister yells out, what comes next? And they look around and they see they're this far from the edge. And if Maggie pushes Kate, Kate's going to hit her head and her head's going to split open. There's going to be all this blood. They're going to have to call the EMTs. That's the end of the party. What a mess. What comes next? Oh, yeah. And everybody moves to the center of the pool. <laughs> We're at the youth conference. There's a lag between activities and two middle school guys are just kind of sitting there. They see the vending machine. They go over. They think they're going to bump it a little bit. What comes next? Well, the conference center staff comes out, looks at them, is disgusted, not because of the bag of chips that's going to fall, but because everything's off the track. They've got to call the service guy. It's going to cost a lot of money. They call the youth minister, and youth minister's embarrassed because all the other youth ministers look at him and say, what's wrong with your kids? Were they raised in barns? <laughs> He's got to call the parents. The parents come. The parents are embarrassed because all the other parents are saying, what's wrong with your kids? Were they raised in barns? <laughs> They're going to Carowinds next week. These kids don't get to go because, by gosh, they acted bad. They're in timeout. All the other kids have to listen to the story about why how we behave when we're out in public and three times cut into what comes next. Right? It's a good question, not just for youth, but for all of us in our lives to take a longer view what comes next. What are going to be the consequences? What's going to unfold in this? What's important? What's not? What can we put down? What do we pay attention to? And brothers and sisters, the gospel passage we just heard is a fabulous example of what comes next. It may well be the most important lines, the most important lines in Christian scripture. What comes next? So before we get there, we have to ask what comes before? This is the very last chapter in the Gospel of Matthew. The very last lines. And right before these lines, we learn that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, probably the sister of Martha and Lazarus, that Mary, go to the tomb to find the body of Jesus and prepare it for burial. They haven't had time to do it before. The sun was going down. They had to be in. They go to the tomb, and the tomb is not on some pastoral field somewhere. It is right downtown Jerusalem. It's like being at Spirit Square. It's right there. And this is a terrifying experience for these two women. 
and they go and they encounter something completely unexpected, completely out of the ordinary. They don't even know what to make of it. And they turn to go back to tell the disciples and they encounter the risen Lord. And he says, go tell my disciples to meet me in Galilee. Go tell them to go to the mount where we were before and I will meet them there. And so the two ladies go. They find the disciples and they tell them, the Lord wasn't in the tomb. We encountered him. He says, go to Galilee. And they are dumbfounded. They don't know what to make of this. But the one thing, the one thing that makes him feel better is he's saying, go to Galilee, get out of Jerusalem. And this is such good news for the disciples. We're going home. We're getting out of here. We're getting away from this wicked place where one of us sells another one out for 30 pieces of silver. We're getting out of this place. We're getting away from Caiaphas and Annas. We're getting away from Herod and his henchmen. We're getting away from these legions of Roman centurions. We're going home. We're going home where people know us, where things unfold the way they're supposed to. We're going home. Where will we stop? Well, we'll go to Peter's house. Because Peter's mother-in-law makes a great, great fish stew. And she does that thing with the date bars. We'll go. We'll eat dinner at Peter's house. Yes, sure, sure. She won't mind. Come on, come on. Then we'll sleep in our own beds. Yeah, that sounds good. Somebody pay the innkeeper quick. We are on the road. Thomas says, I don't know the way to some places, but I know the way home. Come on, let's go. And they get on the road, and they start talking. Say, okay, so what time in the morning are we going to meet on the mount? Nine o'clock? Oh, I don't know. Jesus said, Peter, we better get there early. We'll get there at eight. Okay, okay. Everybody good with that? Go home. They have the fish stew. They eat the date bars. They sleep in their own bed. And the next morning, they go to that mount, that hill on the side of Galilee. That same grassy, gentle slope. They know that hill. That's the hill of their neighborhood. That's the hill where all those people came to hear the sermon on that hill. And all those people were fed. And they look, and coming towards them is Jesus. And they don't understand this. I mean, this makes no sense, but there he is. And they just look at him. And he says... Well, guys, I told you that my father sent me into the world. I told you that I would only be here for a while. I told you they were going to kill me. I told you I was going to die for the whole world, that all this was essential for the world to be redeemed and the possibility of God's dream to come true. I told you that. Now listen. Listen. None of this makes any difference if you miss this point. Those angels and those shepherds going to Mary it doesn't make any difference if you miss this point. Those parables I taught you, it makes no difference if you miss this point. Those leopards, those lepers, those blind people, those deaf people, all those people I healed, it makes no difference if you miss this point. Those people that were hungry and I fed with bread and fish, it makes no difference if you miss this point. The agony... The agony of me on that cross makes no difference if you miss this point. God sent me this one time. This is the moment that all of human history changes. This is the moment, and the moment is this. 
I'm returning to my father, and you, you 11, are to go out and tell my story and make disciples. If you don't do this, everything is for nothing. It all came for this moment. And the gospel ends. And what comes next? Jesus doesn't say another single word on this earth. Not another word was spoken by him. He returns to his father, and the eleven are there on that hill. And they're looking at each other. And somebody has to speak first. And who was it? It's got to be Peter. It's got to be Peter. And Peter says, all right, let's go. Let's go. we got to go make disciples. And they look at each other. And John, maybe it was John. John says, well, Peter, I don't know about you. I don't know how we're going to make disciples. I have a tenuous relationship on it myself. And no offense, but when it came down to it, you denied him three times. And James and, John, James and I argued about who was going to sit next to him, and Thomas can't find his way out of the paper sack. How are we going to make <laughs> disciples? I don't know. I don't know. He didn't tell us. He didn't tell us. He just said, go do it. We have to go do it. How do we do it? How? <laughs> well, okay. So how did he make us disciples? I mean, what was it about him that made us put down those nets and leave our families. I tell you, my wife wasn't happy about that. What, may, what, what did he do so that we gave up our lives or reordered our lives and followed him? What did he do? And maybe Andrew says, you know, the thing that really resonated with me was when he started talking about how he understood who God was. He didn't talk in esoteric terms. He just talked about how God spoke to him and led him and created him. He spoke in words I understood. It wasn't esoteric kind of language. He just talked about how God was real to him. I mean, the way he proclaimed who God was, that really got me. And maybe Matthew said, you know, the thing that really got me was when the Pharisee says, what do you mean healing people on the Sabbath? And he said, yes, we're supposed to take time and honor God on the Sabbath, but when God's beloved need to be healed, when they need to be taken care of, God wants us to do that. I mean, there is ethical behavior. And when he told us, taught us how to behave, with care for one another and with ethics, that's what really moved me. And maybe Thaddeus said, you know, I knew he was the real deal when he talked about going into the wilderness and praying for 40 days. And when we y'all came back down and talked about him praying on that mountain before he went into Jerusalem, because that was the only way he was going to have the strength to do what he needed to do. And when you told me about him praying in the garden, because that was the only way he was going to be able to let them carry him away, that prayer life, that's what really spoke to me. And maybe when the other disciples said, you know, when he healed all those people, when he helped them see in their lives their suffering and their brokenness, that they weren't alone, that God and was there with them, and when they accepted that and their faith made them whole, that's when I knew 
He was more than a prophet. And maybe one of the disciples said, it was the woman at the well. When he talked to her and said, I know your history and I know your brokenness and I know your, the sins you've committed, but that's not all you are. You're more than just that. When he could be with her in that way, that's how I knew he was the real deal. That's when I knew I wanted to follow him. That's when I knew I wanted to listen and be transformed by him. That's how I became a disciple. Five things. Five things Jesus did. We go do those five things. We go out in the world and we do those five things and we'll tell the story and people will believe. Bailey, what came next? They went out and did those five things. And how do we know this? Because the Acts of the Apostles tell us so. It's right there. But if we didn't have the Acts of the Apostles written down, how would we know? How would we know that those disciples went out and did those five things? How would we know? Yeah, it's not even a rhetorical question. It's absolutely true. We're here without those disciples, those 11, doing those five things. How do you explain Matthew Williams and I being in West Virginia clearing out sewage for some woman whose house has flooded? How do you explain Kelly Tinsley and I in Costa Rica working with some kind of bob wire? How would my path and Matt Addington's path have ever crossed? How would you know each other? How would you all know each other well enough to fix meals for each other when one of you is sick? Why would you be in this place? Why would this place be here? It ought to be farmland or a shell gas station. Those 11 went out and did the five things Jesus did, and they did it well on some days and less well on other days, but they did it well enough to make believers. <coughs> generation after generation after generation, they did it well enough to make believers. And brothers and sisters, what comes next? There's a world of people that don't know the story. They don't know it in transformative ways. And there's some that have sort of heard the story, but they don't really know what it means. What comes next? So for me, I'm about to go spend the next 10 weeks trying to figure out how to be a better disciple. I'm about to go figure out how to come back and help you guys be, a better, be better disciples. And while I'm doing that in that 10 weeks, you guys are going to be thinking the same thing. Right? How am I going to be a better disciple? How am I going to tell the story? How am I going to use some of those, do those, engage in those five practices comes down to this moment. Everything else before doesn't matter if we don't go tell and live the story. What comes next? 